The last talk in this series discussing the links between the Titanic and the city of Dundee in Scotland centres on a man usually called James Montgomery Smart. It is the final talk because, despite what I think is an interesting tale, the link to Dundee is tenuous. I was alerted to the story by a note in the Dundee Courier on the 20th of June 1912. It ran, Wanted. Information as to the present address of George and Annie Smart, the children of James Montgomery Smart of New York, who was drowned with the Titanic, or any of his other relatives. Mr James Smart is believed to be a native of Fifeshire, his parents having emigrated to America 60 years ago. The children are believed to be being educated at a Scotch school and to be in receipt of an allowance from a firm of solicitors acting for trustees of a settlement. Reply Hindle, Son and Cooper, Solicitors, Darwin, Lancashire in England. So who was James Montgomery Smart? The best guess is that he was born in 1866 or 1867 in either New York or Boston, Massachusetts. He seems to be known as J. Montgomery Smart, John M. Smart, John Montgomery Smart, James Montgomery Smart, J. M. Smart and Jim Smart. John Smart, born in 1865, appears in the 1881 census in Ontario, Canada, living with William Arnott in Hamilton, Ontario. He is the only John Smart listed in the census in Hamilton and there is some supporting evidence that this may be the Mr Smart in question. A note in a Sydney newspaper in May 1884 is looking for a J.M. Smart of New York who went to Hamilton, Canada in 1879. The same Mr Smart was supposed to have gone to Australia in 1883 and became friends with a Mr Jeremiah Toomey, editor of The Farmer and Grazier and a Mrs A.S. Brown of Sydney. They helped out Mr Smart financially when money did not arrive for him from the United States. Over the next few years, he travelled around Australia, New Zealand and the United States. He is variously described as a travelling salesman, entrepreneur and inventor. He was regarded as an expert in cold storage. In 1895, J.M. Smart submitted a provisional patent application, number 4094, for, and I quote, an improved process of preserving fresh fruit, vegetable products and other articles and substances of food from decay without the use of refrigeration." End quote. Around this time he was telling various business contacts in Australia that he was a special agent of the US Department of Agriculture. However, the Secretary of State of the US Department of Agriculture, Mr J.S. Morton, made a statement saying that Mr Smart is not and never was an agent of the department. In mid-February 1896, J.M. Smart was in Chicago making a deal with the Dr. A.T. Perkins who had patented a process of keeping meats, fruits and perishable products during transportation by the use of sterilised air. Around this time, Mr. Smart seemed to be manager of the Australian Meat Transportation Company as well as incorporating the American Sterilised Air Transportation Company. His plan was to ship Australian meat and fruit to warehouses in the UK. In January 1901, the American Cold Storage and Shipping Company, of which Mr. Smart was President and General Manager, with offices at the Product Exchange in New York, had capital of $2 million. In May 1901, J.M. Smart spoke to the New York Times about a plan to feed England. The Southampton Cold Storage Company had recently erected a cold storage plant near the docks in association with the London and South Western Railway. It was planned to be up and running soon. Mr. Smart spoke about importing $200 million worth of food into the UK annually, with plans to store $10 million worth in Southampton. For various reasons, it took another six or seven years to be up and running. In January 1903, a syndicate took over the Southampton Cold Storage Unit, comprising J.P. Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company, the London and South Western Railway and the American Cold Storage Company. Mr. Smart had 55,000 shares in the latter company. In 1907, the Southampton Company were in dire financial straits and an appeal to Mr. Smart for financial help fell on deaf ears. In 1908, things improved for the Southampton Coal Storage Company with the arrival of 10,500 bales of hops from America. Two years later, contracts for Argentinian beef stabilised the company. The 1911 New York City Directory lists J. Montgomery Smart as the president of the product exchange and the foreign representative of the Graphite Lubricating Company. His address was given as the Victoria Hotel seen here. His habit seems to have been to live in hotels and he does not appear to have had had a permanent home in the US. 
When he bought his ticket for Titanic, he gave his address as 3 Wood End Cottages Kildale, now called Neuro Kildale, by a Grossman, York in England. The ticket was bought in the name John Montgomery Smart. This Yorkshire address was that of William and Sarah Smart, who are probably relations of J.M. Smart, although there is no information on them in the local baptism, marriage or burial registers. He boarded Titanic at Southampton. He was accompanied on the voyage by his lawyer and friend Frederick Kimbert Seward of the law firm Curtis, Mallet, Provost and Colt, who incidentally represented several third-class Titanic passengers pro bono in a two and a half million dollar lawsuit. There were reports that Mr. Smart and Mr. Seward were conducting business negotiations in the UK, but Mr. Seward admits they met coincidentally on Titanic. On the night of the 14th of April 1912, Mr. Smart dined at the table of the chief purser, Hugh McElroy. Mr. Smart died in the sinking and his body, if recovered, was never identified. Mr. Seward survived the sinking. He had been playing cards with William Sloper and his church friend Dorothy Gibson in the first class lounge when the iceberg struck. Miss Gibson insisted that her two male friends join her in the first lifeboat to be launched, boat seven. And so Mr. Seward was saved from the sinking. After the sinking, Mr. Seward started to sort out Mr. Smart affairs. He had known Smart for eight years, and yet when he thought about it, he did not know much. He thought he remembered he said he'd been born in Massachusetts and was about 50 years old. He knew he was tall, robust, and had a florid face and a grey moustache, and that he could be attracted to men when he cared to be. Mr. Smart had told the people that he had two children for whom he had set aside $200,000 and that his wife had died 10 years ago. He also used to tell people he was related to Cardinal John McCloskey, the first American-born Archbishop of New York and the first American Cardinal. His will, prepared in 1897, was sent from Australia by Jeremiah Toomey, who lived in Melbourne. The will stated, This is the last will and testament of me, John Montgomery Smart, of Melbourne, Victoria. After payment of all my debts, funeral and testamentary expenses, I give, devise and bequeath unto Jeremiah Toomey of 52 Market Street, Melbourne, Victoria, and Anne Frances Brown, all my real and personal property in the following manner, viz. One third to Jeremiah Toomey and two thirds to Anne Frances Brown. And I hereby appoint Jeremiah Toomey of 52 Market Street, Melbourne, executor of this my last will. The will was witnessed by Kenneth M. Cox and Lizzie Anderson. Mrs. Brown and Mr. Toomey from Australia were reported to be very surprised when they learned the amount of their inheritance. There was a lot of speculation about the value of Mr. Smart's estate, but in the end they got about $125,000 each in today's money. And while this is a substantial sum of money, surely more would have been expected from the estate of such a prolific businessman who was expected to have a fortune, but in the end did not live up at all to that expectation. Interestingly, in March 1917, Mr. Toomey published an advertisement in the London Gazette asking that creditors submit any claims against Smart's estate. It's not been possible to ascertain if any such claims were made. So what about his two children that were thought to be being educated at a Scotch school and his whereabouts were sought in the Dundee Courier? The search for the children was instigated by Mr. Frederick Stewart. As well as a professional responsibility to Mr. Smart, he also had a personal one, as he would have regarded Mr. Smart as a friend. However, as was seen earlier, when he tried to gather the information he had about Mr. Smart, he realised he did not have much to go on. As regards the children, he knew there was a boy aged 20 years and a girl aged 18 years. He did not know where they were located, and as well as the note in the Dundee Courier, others were placed in newspapers all over Europe and Australia. From his home at 542 West 112th Street, New York, Mr. Seward said he was not sure of the children's names or if they were in England or France or Italy or Spain. He also thought they might be in the custody of a friend of their mother's. Although they spoke often, Mr. Seward felt that Mr. Smart was the most reticent man about his personal affairs. They mostly spoke of business, but Mr. Seward knew that shortly after the mother's death, Smart had sent his children abroad, determined to give them a fully rounded education in Europe. It seemed to be his plan to place them first in one country and then in another, so they could learn the language of each. Mr. Seward went on to say that he assumed that Smart's recent trip abroad was to see his children. As seen earlier, they had met accidentally on Titanic, and whether Mr. Smart mentioned that he had been seeing his children in Europe, or Mr. Seward had assumed so, we will probably never find out. 
The other frustration for Mr. Seward in tidying up Mr. Smart's affairs was the fact that Mr. Smart always carried his personal papers in a trunk marked Personal, which he took with him wherever he went. The trunk was lost at the bottom of the ocean as it went down with Titanic. On Friday the 30th of August 1912, the New York Times blazed the headline, The Smart Heirs Found? Question mark. The article went on to say that Mr. Smart's children were thought to be in a Belgian convent, their names being George and Annie Smart. However, the American consul in Belgium, following up on this news, reported that it came to nothing. His will was repaired in 1897 when his children, according to the ages they were supposed to be in 1912, would have been three and five years. Yet there is no record of them, or indeed his wife, travelling with them from Australia to the US. His children were not mentioned in his will, and although there was a rumour that he had $200,000 put away for his children, this never came to light. So what is to be made of all this? It seems clear that Mr Smart had no children and was never married. There is no evidence of marriage to be found in Australia or the US. His supposed fortune never materialised. The $200,000 he had allegedly put aside for his children was never traced. He was not related to Cardinal McCluskey, as he had claimed. He was never a special agent for the Department of Agriculture in the US. His whole life seemed based on a lie, yet he did remember the two Australians who had helped him financially when he was in trouble. There is one interesting remark made by Mr Seward about his friend and client. He said that Mr Smart knew how to be very attractive to men when he cared to be. Without reading too much into this comment, when it's combined with a fictitious wife and children, the latter being used as an excuse to visit Europe, a picture starts to emerge. In 1912, physical homosexual relations were illegal in the US and the UK. However, in France and the Netherlands, such activity was not against the law. One explanation of the facts outlined above is that J. Montgomery Smart was a homosexual who could not come out in the social circles of his day. He created a fancy life for himself in order to throw off any suspicion. His personal life and affairs were a closed book even to those who thought they knew him well. Over a hundred years later, it's unlikely that any further information clarifying Mr. Smart's life will come to light. There is nothing more than speculation, and while it's interesting, it's also frustrating as it leaves many questions unanswered. I would like to acknowledge the Encyclopedia Titanica website for some of the information used in this talk. More details of this story can be found in the book Dundee Man Lost at Sea, available from Amazon and Kindle. This is the last talk in the series. Please get in touch with any comments by email.